Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thanks to Chairman Latta and Ranking Member Matsui for holding today's hearing and for our witnesses for testifying today. Um, I just want to start my questions um, with a response uh, to Ms. Termarello. Thank you for sharing your perspective and your personal story uh, about your miscarriage and the importance of access to information and support. I'm very sorry for your loss. Um, there is certainly a need for access to medically accurate, real-time information about pregnancy, pregnancy loss, and reproductive health care more broadly. I would submit, however, for this committee's consideration that the answer lies not in Section 230, but in passing the Women's Health Protection Act, which has been referred to this committee for consideration so that women in the United States can have access to the full range of reproductive health care and accurate information about it. I appreciate your response to Ms. Matsui's question, but I disagree that people aren't trying to hurt pregnant women and women experiencing pregnancy loss. That is exactly what legislators in my home state of Texas and others are doing, where extreme legislators are criminalizing pregnancy. They are preventing access to medically necessary miscarriage management and access to medications like mifepristone that are used in miscarriage management. When women who are having miscarriages are going to emergency rooms and being told to wait outside, they are being told to come back when they're sicker, when they have sepsis, when they are on the verge of death. So the other thing we see is that they're even empowering random strangers, giving them standing to sue people, giving random strangers standing to sue people who may have been pregnant and anyone who helps them, anyone including their doctors in states where abortion is illegal like mine. So your testimony that over the last couple of years you have seen the fear in these discussion groups, I think is incredibly powerful and really important for this committee to understand and I, I thank you for sharing it. In my view, the answer does not lie in Section 230, however. It lies in protecting the health, dignity, and freedom of all women in the United States, and we do that by passing the Women's Health Protection Act, and I hope this committee will take that up. It is in our jurisdiction. The last Congress passed it twice, and it's time that we do it again. With the time I have left, I do want to focus on some of the uh, Section 230 issues. And, and Ms. Goldberg, I really want to um, direct my question to you and give you the rest of my time to answer it um, around some of the litigation questions. Because I, too, am a lawyer. I understand uh, very clearly what you're talking about um, when you talk about some of the procedural challenges. But I'm hoping you can explain it for the record and for those watching. Um, because like you, I absolutely fundamentally believe that our legal system and our ability to seek uh, justice in the courts and accountability in the courts is essential to the functioning of our society. And I would appreciate it if you could take the time that I have left, about two minutes, um, and explain very generally how Section 230 operates today as an immunity from suit, as opposed to, say, a defense or an affirmative defense, and how that impacts the discovery process and other things, what it prevents you from being able to do that you might expect in another kind of case. I think that would be really helpful. Thank you. And I couldn't agree more with you about the Reproductive Health Protection Act. Um, so Section 230 is not sexy. It's a procedural act that um, basically def defendant corporations use at the earliest stage possible in a motion to dismiss. So we file a pleading telling a product you know, exactly how our client was injured through its features. And then they, they file motions saying, we're just a forum, you're suing us for speech. And then a judge decides it. What happens is that the cases get thrown out at the earliest stage without the opportunity for discovery. So we never know exactly how much notice the platform had about the harm, how many other similar incidents there were. They don't have to give up any information, and that's what's so fundamental to our civil justice system, is that it, it's all about sharing and exposing the information of bad acts. So these, these companies really get to, to continue to hurt people in the same way and really benefit from this informational imbalance where they know how much they're hurting people and how many similar incidents there are, but, but victims have no idea that there have been you know, 
a thousand people that purchased the same suicide product before them. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I um, thank you for your answer and explaining how this is used, and I think it's something for us to consider as we look to the Section 230 reform. So with that, thank you, and I yield back.